As a neurosurgeon, one of the most painful injuries that I see in the lower back is a lumbar disc herniation, and more specifically, a foraminal disc herniation. So let's talk about it. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 35-year-old man who presented to the emergency department in debilitating pain. He played golf the day before, and he began to feel a twinge in his back around hole 12. He persisted, playing all 18 holes, went home, took some anti-inflammatory medications, and went to bed. When he woke up, he had the most excruciating pain radiating down his leg. Particularly, it was radiating into his thigh. I showed the MRI of his lumbar spine that was performed, and it showed a foraminal disc herniation in L4 and L5. So let's talk about exactly what that is. When we talk about the anatomy of our lower back, we have bones in our back called the vertebrae, and in between each bone is the disc, or the squishy thing that is a shock absorber of the bones in our spine. Anytime we lean forward, lean back, twist side to side, this cartilaginous piece of disc takes a lot of that stress on our back. The integrity of the disc itself is kind of like a jelly donut where you have a hard outer coating and then the inside is more squishy like material. That hard outer coating is called the annulus and the inside is called the nucleus. But for any reason over time with degeneration of the disc, an injury or other things, you can get a tear in the annulus and it may make you more susceptible to having a disc herniation where you have weakness in the wall of that annulus and then the nucleus may leak out. 90 to 95% of the time when someone sustains a disc herniation, it will herniate on the back side of the disc here. However, in 5% of cases, you'll have what's called a foraminal disc herniation where the disc will herniate out to the side. So why is that important? Because the side of the disc is where the foramen is located and the foramen is a hole in the bone where the nerve comes out. And you can see this little yellow thing right here, which is the nerve. And that hole where the nerve exits is kind of small. So if you have anything that occupies space in that foramen, like a disc herniation, it can be exquisitely painful. So you can see here, if you have the nerve and then a disc herniation, it will almost entrap the nerve in the foramen and it's extremely painful. I've seen grown men put to tears with this type of disc issue. How could you get a disc injury here and why is it more common in the other location? If you think about how we move our back, most of the time we're just flexing our back or leaning forward. So we're doing this motion here. So it weakens the disc on this side but with rapidly twisting motions, like in golfing, you can actually put more stress on the outside of the disc and make you more susceptible to foraminal disc herniations. You can also get it with other types of rotational type issues, like lifting a box heavy and then turning. In some cases, we really don't know why someone has a foraminal disc herniation, but what we do know is they're not the most common type. What makes them so challenging as compared to a typical disc herniation is that the patient is typically in a lot more pain and they're difficult to manage conservatively. Not only can the patient be in extreme pain, but they can have associated numbness or weakness. What's interesting is because of the location, they can sometimes be missed on MRI because they can be pretty conspicuous. But if you listen to the patient, identify where they're having pain, and then particularly look at the MRI when you see the patient and you see the issue that they're having, most of the time the clinician can figure it out. The radiologist doesn't always have the luxury of seeing the patient, they're just looking at the imaging study. So it's important for someone to clinically be able to see the patient, see the image, and understand both to make the diagnosis. That's why as surgeons, we will often ask the patient where they feel it, where does it start and where does it stop? And that's why, because we wanna know which nerve is affected. In our patient, his pain seemed to be more in the L4 dermatome, where it radiated around to the front of his thigh, around to the inside of his knee and into the proximal shin area. And on his MRI scan, he had a foraminal disc herniation at L4 and L5, which you can see right here on the MRI, as well as right here. And it's really subtle for those that don't typically look at MRI scans. Now, there was a few of you that commented that you were surprised that the patient had an MRI in the emergency department. And that's pretty true because most of the time, unless we think someone has cauda equina syndrome, 
We don't typically perform MRIs in the emergency department setting. However, in certain instances where the patient does have profound weakness, we do perform emergency studies to rule out something more serious. And in his case, he was having a hard time even bearing weight on his leg. Risk factors for foraminal disc herniation include occupation and lifestyle. Patients that have jobs that include repetitive bending certainly do put themselves at risk for injuring their back over time. Genetics play a role in it. Being overweight makes you more susceptible to injury as well as nicotine use. Nicotine affects the blood vessel supply to our disc and affects our ability to be able to heal our disc from injury. Those smokers typically do have a higher rate of disc degeneration and injury to their disc. Patients that have a sedentary or inactive lifestyle are also at risk because they don't build the muscles that help strengthen the spine. And the spine needs a lot of muscle support to prevent our back from being injured. Maintaining a healthy weight, not smoking, and keeping yourself in shape are incredibly important for back injury prevention. Now that we've talked about the risk factors, this guy's injured his back. So what do we do now? We absolutely try to manage these conservatively in most cases where we treat the patients with medications, especially in the acute setting when they're in a lot of pain. Steroid medications to decrease inflammation can be tremendously helpful, as well as neuropathic medications like gabapentin or Lyrica that can attack the pain source right at the nerve and help minimize the pain. Once the pain is a little bit better controlled, physical therapy and occupational therapy may help the patient reduce the amount of pain that they're in. Injections directly targeting the source of pain may also help. We certainly don't want to do surgery unless it's absolutely necessary, but I do find in cases like this where the patients are in debilitating pain, often we do have to talk about it. So if the patient is in too much pain, we can go through the risks and benefits of surgery, or if they go on to fail conservative treatment over a period of time, we can also discuss surgery as well. The problem with foraminal disc herniations is that they're often difficult to treat surgically because the approach is not your typical approach. This is a great animation video that I got from the Swift Institute on YouTube that shows how we treat lumbar disc herniations. Here you can see where the disc is herniated and the piece of the disc is compressing the nerve. Here is an animation of the spine and we can use a series of dilators to help access the spine. Here we make a small incision on the back and that's followed by several metal dilators to help place a portal that will give us access to that region of the spine. After the portal is in place, we will use a surgical microscope that will allow us visualization through that tube, which is typically about 18 millimeters or this big. So our visualization is pretty small. Once we visualize the back part of the spine, we will use a drill to help remove a small amount of bone to give us access down to the disc. And after we have access to the disc, we can retract the nerve and then place special instruments down the tube to help remove the fragment of disc that is herniated. Minimally invasive surgery like that, we will make an incision that's about two centimeters long. But there's another procedure that we can do endoscopically that does the same operation through a seven millimeter portal or an even smaller incision. Here you can see where a camera goes down that small portal that's accessed through the side of the spine and we can visualize directly the disc herniation, which is this white fluffy material here. We can place instruments down to remove that disc in one piece from the spine. And here you can see where that material is being removed from the spine. It's pretty gratifying. And there are some surgeons that will even do it in an open fashion where we'll use an even bigger incision to dissect the muscle off the spine for direct visualization to remove the disc in that fashion. So how do we know which one is better? It is by far the most common procedure that we do in spine surgery. And in my opinion, the way to do it is the way that your surgeon is most comfortable doing it. Some surgeons are very comfortable doing it open, others very comfortable doing it through a metrics tube or minimally invasive, and other surgeons are even most confident doing it endoscopically. I will say that there are few surgeons that are trained on endoscopic spine surgery, and I do think that over time that will continue to improve. For a foraminal disc herniation, because of how far out to the side that you do have to get to get to that disc herniation, 
Typically, an endoscopic approach will be the most minimally invasive way of doing it. Some surgeons may even opt to resorting to fusion because of how challenging it is to get that far out laterally to the spine to access that disc herniation. We did end up admitting this patient for pain control, but he was in too much debilitating pain. And after days of attempting to control his pain, he opted to proceed with surgery. My hands, I did it in a minimally invasive fashion, removed that piece of disc, and he awoke from surgery with no more pain. The bottom line is there are many correct ways of approaching spinal pathology, and one surgeon may choose a different path than another, and it doesn't mean that one answer is right or wrong. Our patient went home the day after surgery, and six months later, he's doing great and back to playing golf. But I did have him on restrictions for quite a period of time after surgery. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care, Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.